Well, go ahead and turn to all the people you know and just tell them you're lucky you got to sit by me tonight, huh? They're lucky to hang out with you, and uh, I'm pumped to be at church on a Wednesday night. How many of y'all like it feeling like summertime out there, man? It feels awesome outside, so the gray is gone, and the sun is here, and praise the Lord for it. I'm pumped about it, and uh, I'm excited to get to teach a little bit tonight. I want to encourage you, before we get started, to invite somebody this week. I want you to invite somebody to come out to church, and I'm telling you, we do a series for the next three weeks. It's an illustrated series. It's at the movies, and uh, a lot of times whenever we do series like that, to be honest, it's a lot more work for all of us. For me as a preacher, for all of the production team, we go the second mile, and we try to create something, and here's the reason we create stuff that's out of the box like that. We create it to give you a reason to invite somebody to church. Because it's one thing to invite somebody and say, hey, come here, my preacher. He'll be on a stage. He's kind of a sweaty uh, guy. He'll be up there talking a lot. Come hear him. How I many know that doesn't sound as good? But if you can say we got something special at church this weekend. We've got this thing called At the Movies. They'll be preaching out of movie clips and time biblical principles that are found in movies. You ought to come check it out. How I many know now you got something that makes it easy to invite? Is anybody out there uh, thankful that somebody invited you to the house of God? Anybody thankful that somebody invited you? Uh, I see my, uh, my, my mom's back here, and, and she brought me to church all the time when I was a kid until I got old enough to kind of rebel and say, hey, I'm not going. You know, I was, I was graduated. I was out and all that. And then uh, my niece, Chelsea, is sitting by her right now, but her mother and father uh, back in the day prayed for me and invited me like every day. They just prayed for me. They invited me like every day. And I, I left them standing at the church door I don't know how many weeks in a row. If you ever waited on somebody, you invite them to church, they tell you they're coming. You say, hey, I'll meet you at the door and I'll sit with you. How many of y'all have ever been stood up at a church door, man? That's, yeah, I'll tell you, everybody ought to be in that club in this room because you hadn't lived till you've been left standing at a church door. That's just a Christian rite of passage. And finally, they invited me enough that I came. Now, I kind of believe this. I believe when we start inviting somebody to church, you know, 80% of Americans that are born again are born again because somebody invites them to church. They come and they sit in the seats. They hear the gospel message. God touches their heart and they give their life to Jesus. And I feel like it's one of our highest callings as believers to invest in somebody and invite them to church. I mean, it's powerful and it's how God moves. And I believe that if we start inviting, we kind of open up a doorway for the Spirit of God to work in their lives. And I believe God's going to do something supernatural this weekend. Would you pray with me that this weekend service goes great, that people get touched, they get, they get touched by the Spirit of God, they get born again. Come on, somebody say amen. Give God a hand clap if, you, if you're believing God with me for that, that to happen this weekend. Uh, got some dear friends here. We have Pastor Chris and uh, Pastor Sue McDonald. Y'all stand up and wave at them just one second. Let them know. Y'all give them a hand clap. They're hanging out. We love these guys. And I'll tell you, God's been using them. They went down and took a church that was in trouble in Marion, Kentucky, in Crittenden County, Kentucky. And uh, I've seen that church before where I've walked in there and it was like 40, 50 people in the house. And God's touched it and God's moved in it. And now they've been hitting Sundays that are over 400 people there in a, in a small town, small county. I mean, it's powerful. As far as I know, right now, that church is the largest church that I, I can remember in the history of Crittenden County. If there was one larger, I, I don't remember it. And uh, I believe it's only going to keep growing. God's going to do something supernatural. Chris, come up here and say hi to him for a second. Tell him, tell him what's going on. They're building a building. What's up, River City? <laughs> How you doing? So, yeah, yeah, God's blessing it. It's awesome. And uh, we're in the process of building a building. And so we also have a text to give. Uh, if you want to throw down on some of that, so, uh, you know, but, uh, yeah, it's awesome what God is doing, and I'll tell you what else is awesome, what he's doing with River City Church, what he's doing through your pastors, and, uh, I just preached a message last week, and it was entitled, Are You Asking For Enough? I talked to Pastor Brian the other day, he said, man, I just really got a vision to plant a hundred campuses. And people think I'm crazy. I said, Pastor, I don't think you're crazy. In fact, I believe you'll do it. Because I believe God really gets involved when we start asking for stuff 
that is so far beyond what you can do yourself. When you get out on the edge and you ask for something, it, it would be impossible to do on your own. Now you really get God involved in the process. And so, you know, are you asking for enough? And I'm saying, ramp it up. Go big. And uh, Psalm 2.8 in the message says this, What do you want? Name it. The nations for a present? That's a question. The continents for a present? I don't know about anybody else that follows Jesus, but I'm thinking the nations as a present, a continent as a present. I mean, we are called to go to the whole world, right? So a hundred campuses. I don't know how many we're going to plant. I'm not quite at a hundred yet. I'd like to just get one more under my belt. And uh, But hey, it's awesome. I, I'm in on it. I believe with you for that. I believe we need to put our tent stakes out, right? Lengthen our cords, really believe God. Get out of what you can do yourself and lean on God. Amen? Thank you. I love you. Appreciate you, Chris. Chris is a covenant. Chris and Sue are covenant friends of ours, and uh, we're blessed to know them. They encourage me all the time. And uh, there'll be times, you know, we all live in a natural world, and we fight the fight of faith. But uh, how many of y'all have ever gotten down before just a little bit? I mean, we can admit it in here. And uh, if I get down, Chris will call, and he'll prophesy me back up. And if Chris gets down, he calls, and I prophesy him back up. And I'm thankful for friends in the body of Christ. Come on, let's give God a hand clap for all our, our people that are with us. Who you with, man? It's big being with somebody. Amen? Hey, I want you to open up your Bibles to the text we've been studying the last couple of weeks and I'm going to pick up where I stopped on Sunday morning and I've been talking about the topic of are we cursed or are we blessed and I specifically started talking this Sunday morning on the blessings of Abraham the blessings of Abraham you know the Bible promises this that the blessings of Abraham or the blessing that's on the Jewish nation does not just reside now on the Jewish nation but the blessing that God put on the Jewish nation in the Old Testament is now every person's in this room. You are now an owner or a partaker of that blessing. Is that good news, church, that we're partakers of the blessing of Abraham? And you can find that clear cut written in the New Testament. You know, uh, Christians need to learn to see themselves as blessed. How we see ourselves, how we think, is how we begin to act. And how we begin to act begins to produce and shape the spirit of our entire life. And so there's a lot of people that have cursed thinking. They've been trained to think cursed. They were raised by a group of people that operated in the curse. They were raised by a group of people that thought cursed. They thought if it wasn't for bad luck, we'd have no luck at all. How many of y'all have ever heard about somebody say that? And they'll be like, they'll say things like, well, good things happen to other people, but nothing but bad stuff comes my way. And whenever they think cursed like that, that begins to overtake their life. And some of us were raised, uh, you know, to be honest, my, my family was always pretty positive, so I'm thankful for that. They didn't even necessarily have teaching just like we're teaching, raised in a Christian home, but, but there's something about being a group of people that are positive, and they believe something good can happen in their life. And uh, just, just being in that spirit and that atmosphere helps you. But on the other side, some people were raised in very negative, dark, downer type, type systems and households. How many of y'all would kind of say the household you came out of was kind of down like that? You, you got that kind of thing to contend with. So if you got that kind of thing to contend with, I'm telling you, what you got to do is you've got to let the Word of God begin to wash and change your mind the way you think. Romans chapter 12 says we renew our minds with the Word of God. And as we renew our mind with the Word of God, we make the things that we used to think were impossible now possible. And here's what the Bible says about you and cursing and blessing. Galatians chapter 3 verse 9 through 14, it says, Then those who are of faith, so then those who are of faith, how many of you are of faith out there? You believe Jesus is the Messiah. All right. So then those who are of faith, they're blessed with believing Abraham. Somebody say, I'm blessed. Come on, say it again. I'm blessed. One more time. I'm blessed. So then those who are of faith, they are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. 
Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Come on, that's, that's hand clap ground right there, man. I'm telling you, Christ has redeemed us. Anybody think we'll be redeemed from the curse, man? Curse is broken off of your life. Christ has bought us back from the curse of the law. Listen, there's a curse that's on every person on the earth that's outside of Jesus. Our curse is real absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. The first thing that happened after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God comes down, finds them. Y'all know the story. Adam and Eve, they're hiding in the garden, and he comes down, and he's calling for them. And they're hiding, and he's calling, and they're hiding, and that thing's still going on today. And he comes to them, and he sees them, and they, they've, they put together uh, like fig leaf bikinis and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know that, that how modern their bikini outfit was, the fig leaves, but he finds them, and he sees them in clothes. And he's like, uh, what's up with your clothes? What are you trying to do? They're trying to cover their sin and their shame and their own power. How many know none of us will ever cover our sin or our shame in our own power? It's, in part, it's, it's impossible to put together a good enough looking outfit to hide our sin before the eyes of God. So God steps down and he covers them. How many of y'all are thankful that God covers us when we can't cover ourselves? And the Bible says that somehow he kills some animals. He takes some, some fur. Something has to die to cover sin, by the way. Sin cannot be remitted without something dying. And sin ultimately could not be remitted without Christ dying on the cross. And he brings these coverings and he covers them. Now I think, I'm thankful that I serve a God that covers me. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm thankful we're the kind of church we believe we ought, to, we ought to have you covered. Right? When people mess up, we're not looking to knock them down. People mess up, I'm not looking to expose them. When, when people mess up, the Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. How many of y'all want to live in a house of grace where we cover people and love people and help people and serve people? Come on, we're going we're gonna to cover them, get them out of their mess in life. Is anybody thankful that the church helped you get out of a mess at one point in life? Man, I'm so thankful. If it wasn't for the house of God, I'd still be in my mess. We're going to create a culture that covers. Amen? I'm not talking about covering up something nasty. Talking about just being good. The Bible says if somebody's overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, lest the same thing comes upon you. And just having that kind of heart, God shows up and he, he, begins, to, he begins to cover them and take care of them. And, and that's what he does. But then after that, he starts to prophesy. God himself prophesies in, in Genesis right at the beginning. And he begins to talk about a curse. The curse of the fall. The book of beginning starts out talking about a curse. Curses are real. And he says, the ground's going to be cursed to the man. Now by the sweat of your labor, you'll bring forth the fruit of the earth. And then he turns around and he says, the ground, there'll be a thorn there now where there wasn't in the past. He turns around and he talks to the woman in, in childbirth. He says, it's going to be labor now. It's going to be work when you bring forth the child. He turns around and he curses the serpent. Some point the serpent went upright on his, he had a different setup. I don't know what it is. People will say they found snakes that are like this somewhere in the earth. I think a lot of that's just Facebook stuff. I don't believe it. How many of you see it on Facebook? It's got to be true. Come on, somebody. It's got to be, it's got to be accurate. But the, cur the, 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 the snake then has to go on its belly right after that because of the curse. Right then the whole world changes because a curse comes upon it. So I'm telling you, then there's, there's the curse of the law. That's the curse of the fall. Everybody say the curse of the fall. Second thing, there's the curse of the law. Then the law is given to Moses. We talked about it, Deuteronomy chapter 28. So if you break these laws, the Jewish nation, this curse will come upon you. That's the curse we're reading about. And here's the deal. How many of you out there have ever broken the law of God? How many of you have ever told a lie? See your hand. Look at your neighbor and just tell them, say, you were a liar. Just tell them that. We don't say you are a liar. Jesse hates it when I do this. How many, of you ever, how many of you ever got mad and said a cuss word? Oh, you guys got a bunch of potty mouths out there, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Praying for you. Get your neighbor and say, don't be a potty mouth. Just tell them that. Oh, don't be a potty mouth. But you can tell I got little kids, right? Now I'm saying, you know, anyway. Uh, it's funny what kids hear and will repeat, by the way, isn't it? Uh, I'll tell a story that's pretty funny. And... Uh, I got a little girl, just sweet as she could be, you know. She's like three or something. We got this, uh, this coon dog that came to us as a refugee. 
You know, everybody gets rid of a coon dog because they howl all night. I know why they let him go. See, he'd howl all night long. His name was uh, Alien. So he came to me seeking refuge, you know, and I helped him out. And uh, he'd howl all night. But anyway, one day Alien comes walking into the, into the garage. My little three-year-old's walking by the dog. She turns around. She looks at Alien. She says, well, how the heck? But she said the other word. How the heck are you, Alien's what she says. Three-year-old daughter. And I'm like, holy moly, Jesse, you got to clean your language up. Our kids are already, already talking like you. Huh? April Cooper was there, wasn't it? April, did you teach my kid that? I'm going to cast the devil out of you after this service. Um, I don't even know what I'm talking about, but it's funny right now. So I'm going with it, all right? Um, it's, it's the curse of the law. We've all broken somehow the law of God. Because of that, the curse of the law is on our life. And only one person could break the curse off of our life. If there's anything I want you to know is that no curse can have you if you're in Christ. I want you to know the curse of the fall isn't on you anymore. The curse of the law isn't on you anymore. Any curse of this world can't reside on you anymore. If you're blessed by God, you are now impossible to curse. And there's nothing on this earth that can curse me anymore. I don't have to be cursed with sickness. Come on, somebody. I don't have to be cursed with poverty anymore. I don't have to be cursed with small thinking. I don't have to be cursed with depression. You don't have to be cursed with anxiety. I'm telling you, the curse is broken off of your life. You ought to rejoice like it's done. The curse is gone. There's not one smell of the stink of the curse on your life anymore. All right? And it, it, now I'm not just cur not cursed. I'm also blessed. Curse is lifted. Blessing is on us. Now, I feel like, I don't, I'm going to preach this till I feel like our church gets it right now. It's just the way I feel about it. I mean, I, I really felt the Spirit of God's like, you've got to inject this into the people's thinking. Because, um, I don't know, it's just like, it's just like sometimes uh, there, there's an attitude of an, an area or a city. And if you, if you dwell there long enough, we're good, we're, we're pretty, I'm telling you, we're good people in the area. I'm for, I'm, uh, we're better than a lot of people on the earth. As far as like a moral base, um, our region is way more moral than like if you were to go out to the West Coast and hang out in Southern California. Come on, let's give God a hand clap for making our, we're way more moral. I'm thankful for that. And, and more moral than a lot of the Northeast. You go to the Northeast. I'm telling you, it's just a better, as far as morality goes, uh, there's been enough church folk here. Enough Catholic folk that had a, a, a morality, enough Baptist folk that had a morality that they knew there's a right and wrong, there's a God in heaven, there's a judgment, there's, we're going to answer. And knowing that there's a God, how many know it changes the culture? Even if they're not your exact flow or your flavor of Christianity, it changes the culture. You go to some areas where it's more godless, and I'm telling you the culture is totally different. Travel to some foreign countries and look around where there's no understanding of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and, and the psalmist wrote this about those places, that the dark places of the earth, dark places, places without gospel light, they're full of the habitation of cruelty. There's a crueler base in those areas. So as far as morality goes and that kind of thing, it, it, it's good here. But I'm telling you, in, in our region of the earth, I do feel like there's, there's a bit of this kind of mindset that's on us that good enough is just good enough. Good enough is just good enough. And getting by is good enough to just get by. Uh, and there's some totally different thinking in other parts of the country. Like, like if you go, I'll, I'll just give you an example. If you go to, to Texas, and I know about Texas because I'm married to a Texan, and, and uh, out there, how many know the Texans want everything to be big? Right? Big hair, big hats, big belt buckles, big stakes. Big, big, big. Bigger is better, right? And why they think like that collectively. And, and it's not always good because I'm, you, you can go like to certain parts of Dallas, Texas. Uh, there's areas like South Lake. And it is the that big thing has become almost a celebration of mammon. I'm telling you. Everything's big, isn't it? I mean, here's a boy from Houston. Everything is big and excessive. But, but so I'm not talking about celebrating mammon. But how many of you think that we as a people in our region, that we could do more, we could produce more, we could prosper at a higher level? Is anybody into that? 
we could see something supernatural coming to our region. Maybe if we all believe collectively, we could get some new industry flowing in our area. How many of you would like for our sons and daughters to have something to do right here where they wouldn't have to go somewhere else and look for an industry? Does anybody want to see our economy do better? Huh? I want to see that. I want to see the region blessed. And, and if you're in any kind of, any kind of um, area that's got a certain kind of thinking, it, it gets on you. Like, think about Abram from the Old Testament, Abraham's nephew Lot. The Bible says he pitched his tents towards Sodom, all right? He liked the nightlife. He liked to boogie. That's what it says, all right? Come on. He liked what was going on in the cities because out on the farm, it gets sleepy about 9 o'clock, right? And Lot said, I'm going to hang out towards Sodom. I like the nightlife. I like to boogie. And... Uh, so, so he was there, and he was even a righteous man, the Scripture says. I'm not saying he was perverse in all his ways. But, but something about the atmosphere of Sodom and Gomorrah began to affect Lot and his family. Think about it. An angel shows up. Angels show up and tell you and your family, I'm about to destroy this city. About to take it out, wipe it out. Get it all together, get out of here, and don't look back. And there was something about the atmosphere they'd been in. Lot's wife is walking out, and that, that they'd pitched their tents towards Sodom. They've been around the spirit and the attitude of that area so long. They start walking out, and she keeps looking back. But I remember, and boom, there's a curse that comes upon her because she disobeys the prophetic word, turns into a pillar of salt. I'm just saying all that to say the atmosphere we live in begins to affect us whether we admit it or not. How many of you know the atmosphere is affecting us, right? And so I don't want us to live with this cursed kind of thinking that this is it. This is, this is all it's ever going to be. And what we got today might be great, but how many you know God needs more out of us to advance the gospel in the future? So that, that's what it's about. It's about advancing the gospel. That's, what, that's my heart. When I talk about, when I got to be careful because when I talk about doing more, having more, prospering, what I'm talking about is God using us as instruments, as kings and priests in the earth to establish and have influence, to preach the gospel at a higher level. Because it's the gospel that matters. It's eternity that matters. I've got six minutes left, and I haven't even talked about anything I'm supposed to talk about tonight. All this is free right now, okay? I'm going to start here in a second. We're going to reset the clock, and I'm going to start over from the beginning, all right? So it's only going to be another 76 minutes, and I'll let you go home tonight. Um, I, I want you to learn to think blessed. So I want you to say this out loud. Somebody say, I'm a blessed man. Say this out loud. The blessing of Abraham is on my life. One more time. The blessing of Abraham is on my life. Come on, one more time. The blessing of Abraham is on my life. The curse is broken, and the blessing is on me. Say it again. The curse is broken, and the blessing is on me. So what will that blessing produce? If you look at Abram's life, and I, I suggest that you go read about the life of Abram. Because Abram at first, he, his name becomes Abraham. And he's got uh, unbelievable faith stories. Matter of fact, the scripture calls Abraham the father of faith. He's such a blessed guy. He so follows and flows with the Spirit of God. He becomes the very father of faith. How I many know you've arrived if the Bible calls you the father of faith? You ought to go read about it. God calls him in Genesis chapter 12. He says this to him. He says, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country. This is the beginning of his, of his walk of faith. Genesis 12. God calls him out, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. Doesn't even know where he's going. Abraham embraces the faith walk. I'm telling you to live the blessed life, you're going to have to embrace the faith walk. You don't get all the plan when you start. Somebody say amen to that. Tony, so, so, some of you are still waiting to walk because you think you're going to have like, people have talked about purpose and destiny and uh, prophecy, and I'm for all of those things. But sometimes we'll talk about it where it'll almost sound like God's going to show up uh, and, and three prophets are going to hunt you down, tell you exactly what you're supposed to do for the rest of your life. And life just does not work like that. Just doesn't work like that. God gives you a bit, doesn't he, Pastor Chris? Just a bit. Tell you about Pastor Chris. God called him, started calling him to preach, him and Sue. 
I'm going to tell a story for him, and if I don't like his version, I just make it up, and I make it my own. And it's, it's fun like that when you have the microphone. So uh, God, told, God told Pastor Chris and Sue, he, he started got feeling a call to preach, saw, saw guys, I think saw Jesse's dad, videos of him preaching in Honduras, preaching to crowds of people. Her daddy used to preach to crowds of 20,000 people in Honduras all the time. Uh, had preached to every large and medium-sized city in the nation of Honduras except one. God told him to, to cover the nation of Honduras with the gospel. And back before Honduras was as evangelized as it is now. And he was faithful to that. As a matter of fact, he was praying about this. I'll show you how God works. Supernaturally at times he'll confirm things, but he didn't give you everything. He's praying about going to Honduras. All right? Pastor Rand in the back used to work with my father-in-law. And he's praying about going to the nation of Honduras. And God speaks to Pastor Rand. He hadn't told anybody's thing about going to Honduras. He speaks to Pastor Rand to go and prophesy to Pastor David that he's to be an evangelist to the nation of Honduras. So Pastor Rand goes and gets a, a flag from the nation of Honduras. That's why prophets are so much fun when they start prophesying because they get spooky, right? I like that. And he walks into his office, puts a flag on David of Honduras and says, Thus saith the Lord, you're called to be an evangelist to the nation of Honduras. Come on, how many know our God's alive? He still speaks. He hadn't told anybody. Boom, those are all people we know I'm telling you these kind of things. How many are thankful our God still speaks? Let's really give him a hand clap. He, he does that. And he gives you a peace. That's all you get. How do you do it? I don't know. Am I going to give you the money? Probably not today. Right? Who are you going to get connected with? I'll show you. You go to a land that I will show you. So you put the car in drive, right? I got a direction. Most of the Christian life is just about a direction. No more, no less. If you're waiting on clarity, forget about it. You're not going to get it. What you get is you get a word and you operate by faith and God will show you the rest. And don't think that ever, somebody, super spiritual people that tell you God speaks to them every day in a voice, I'm always leery. It's your neighbor and say, be afraid. Just, uh, I don't really, I'm not putting fear on anybody, but I watch those people. Because some of these people, they're always hearing something. God tells them to do something different every 10 minutes. They're not spirit led. They might be a free spirit, but there's a difference between being a free spirit and being spirit led. Let me say that again. There's a difference between being a free spirit and being spirit led. And the two things have nothing to do with the other, do they? Two totally different things. The free spirit typically is just non-committal. Ain't that America? Thank you, John Cougar Mellencamp, huh? Right? It's, 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 it has nothing to do. They're just non-committal. And, uh, man, I love, I love millennials. I love you. I'm, I'm, I'm for you. And I've met some in my age group that already started manifesting. Sorry, millennials right here. They're like, here we go. The millennial talk. God help us. I, lo I love you all. And there's some, there's some committed millennials in the room. I see some of you right now. Uh, multiples. But as, as the stats kind of show that they're, they're more non-committal than a lot of the generations before them. I started noticing it when we planted this church. Some kids that were my age at the time, I'm 40, these people are 40 now. They've been in the church, they're around the church, you'd ask them, hey, can you greet or something? These were committed Christians. These weren't people just finding their way out of the dark. And they're like, well, I just can't commit to anything. I just can't commit to anything. And you're like, good luck in life if you can't commit to anything. The only way we build is through commitment in life. Come on, somebody. Nothing else happens without commitment. And so, so here's, here's what the spirit-led person does. The spirit-led person gets a direction, and they fight it out till it comes to pass. Going to fight it out, right? I'm picking a path. Here's the path. God's already given me my direction. Now, he may, he may show me a little something different, every, every, but it's the general direction, right? God's not changing directions every 10 minutes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many of y'all are thankful that God was for us 2,000 years ago at the cross? How many of y'all are thankful he's still for us today? Come on. How many of y'all are thankful he's for you when you got water baptized? Amen? And he's still for you right now tonight. He hadn't changed his correction. He's committed himself unto us. 
So much he made a covenant. And he doesn't just make that covenant. He keeps that covenant. So God speaks to Abram and he says, Abram, come out. Come out to a land I'm going to show you. Says, Where's it going? I'm not telling you. What direction it is? It's over yonder somewhere. It's yonder. He doesn't, he doesn't get that. And he just takes off walking by faith. Now I'm telling you, he's the father of faith. And because he's the father of faith, he gets so blessed, his whole life changes. You know what it says about Abram at the end of his life? It says this in the book of Genesis. It says, when Abraham was old and well advanced in age. When Abraham was old, not this is a, there's a lesson to all of us, my age group, a little older, a little younger. Uh, I don't know where old is, so I'll let you define that so you don't hate on me. But I'll say, uh, old is a decade older than whatever you are, right? That's the way it works. So um, when Abraham was old, that means you're not going to get everything just like you think you should when you're young. I mean, y'all think life's going to take some commitment, take some work, and little by little, bit by bit, the blessing of God comes on. You start to see it, right? The Bible says when Abraham was old and well advanced in age, the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Everybody say all things. Now then those who are of faith, how many are of faith out there? Galatians 2, 9. Then those that are of faith, they're blessed with believing Abraham. Genesis said when Abraham was old and well advanced in age, the Lord had blessed Abraham in what? What, what, what things? Man, when Abraham was old and well advanced in age, I believe this. I believe the blessing of Abraham is going to work in my life like this. When Brian is old and well advanced in age, the Lord will have blessed Brian in all things. It's the way it's going to be. When Jared was old and well advanced in age, the Lord had blessed Jared. Come on, somebody. He blessed him in family, blessed him in his marriage, blessed him with a child of promise, blessed him in cattle, blessed him in flocks, blessed him financially, blessed him with friendship with God himself. The Bible says Abram was a friend of God. It's one thing to get the promises of God it's a whole nother thing to be a friend with the promiser. The blessing of Abraham made Abram a friend with the promiser himself. I'm here to tell you the blessing on your life is going to bless you where you have relationship with the promiser himself. And if you have relationship with the promiser himself, how easy is it going to be to flow into the promises? Come on, we've got the blessing of Abraham on our life. Come on, let's really give him a hand. Let's worship him. Stand up on your feet. Let's worship him for a little bit. Lord, we thank you tonight that the blessing of Abraham is on our life. We thank you tonight that the promiser is here with us and in us and around us. But I'm telling you, you're a blessed people, not a cursed people. You're a blessed people and not a cursed people. You're a blessed people and not a cursed people. You're a blessed people and not a cursed people. You're a blessed people, not a cursed people. You're a blessed people, not a cursed people. You're a blessed people, and not a cursed people. You're a blessed person, not a cursed person. You are blessed coming in. You're blessed going out. Head not the tail. Everything you touch, it works. That's the blessing of God on your life. So now start to see it. Start to believe it. Start to receive it. Man, you ought to get up in the morning and say, the blessing of Abraham's on my life. Today I'm going to walk it out. I'm going to live in it. Whenever you go to work, you ought to walk into that workplace. Man, the blessing's on this place because I'm here, because a child of Abraham's here. Whenever you, whenever you walk in, whatever it is, going to a family function, the blessing of God just walked in whenever you walked in. So the blessing's on your life. And I'm not talking about being arrogant. I'm talking about knowing the promises of God. Now, if anything, that makes you humble, not arrogant. But on the inside right here, we got to see ourselves as blessed. Amen? Amen. Now, why are we blessed? It's nothing that we've done. It's the gift of God. We didn't earn it. We didn't fight for it. We're not good enough to keep it. How does a blessing come? It comes by faith. Some of you come from backgrounds where you think you still kind of got it in your mind. Where if I'm good enough, then maybe God can bless me. Now, I watch a lot of people that have it. I see some people from the, uh, uh, you're from like a Catholic background. And it was all, if I pray enough prayers, if I do enough this, if I give enough, if I'm there enough, then maybe God will bless me. 
Some people are from like Pentecostal charismatic backgrounds. You got a similar kind of thinking. I mean, you thought anytime you, you, you know, you hit, hit a possum crossing the road, you were going to hell for it or something. And you got you to have that kind of thinking, you know what I mean? Got mad, said a cuss word, better repent if I die right now, I'll go to hell. You got that kind of thing going. How many know we got a God that's the God of all grace? How many know we couldn't be good enough to save ourselves in the first place? We can't be good enough to earn the grace of God. It is the favor of God given to us. And how do we receive it? We receive it by believing. And as we believe, it comes into our life and it changes every area of our life. It's believing on Christ. How many are thankful that God's not keeping score on us in heaven anymore? Come on. It's good news, isn't it? It's gospel. It's God of all grace.